I'd like to thank the organizers of the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation for the opportunity to present at this conference. My name is Tim Pollack. I'm the chair of surgery at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. And I'm going to be talking to you today about surgical management of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I have the privilege to work on the development practice guidelines for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma with uh, John Bridgewater, who's here with us today, as well as a number of other leaders in the field. This paper was published in the Journal of Hepatology a number of years ago, and I'll be using a general outline for my discussion of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma today. I'll start off discussing uh, epidemiology and risk factors. So as you all know, the incidence of cholangioma varies dramatically worldwide. Incidence of roughly one to two in the United States and an incidence as high as seven to 10, 10 um, per 100,000 in areas um, of Asia. And in fact, in some areas of Thailand, in Northern Thailand, the incidence can be as high as 85 per 100,000 where liver fluke is endemic. Over the last several decades, there has been a shift in the epidemiology of cholangiocarcinoma. As you can see here, the overall incidence of extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma has been decreasing, while there's been an increase in the incidence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The reason for this is likely multifactorial. Some of this may be a reclassification bias. What I mean by that is in, in the 80s and 90s, when there was a tumor in the list diagnosed as adenocarcinoma, Frequently, it would be read out by pathologists as adenocarcinoma not otherwise specified. However, more recently, with improved immunohistochemical staining and more expertise among hepatopathologists, we're able to identify and diagnose primary adenocarcinoma or primary cholangio, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma of the liver. I do, however, think that some of the increased incidence of intrahepatic carcinoma is a real phenomenon. Here are some of the risk factors associated with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and these are very geographically varied in nature. In Asia, things like hepatobiliary flukes and cholidocal cysts are more associated with cholangiocarcinoma. Well, in Western countries, things like PSC, and then in particular, obesity and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis have dramatically increased the risk of patients to develop intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. This is a slide from a paper that we wrote looking at the incidence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma among patients who had underlying steatosis and steatohepatitis. Just as the oxidative stress of fatty deposition in the liver can place patients at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma, so too can steatosis increase risk of uh, liver hepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And this may be one of the reasons why we're seeing intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma increase along with the epidemic of obesity. There have been many advances in the understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of intrahepatic cholangioma. And I won't belabor this as I know other speakers will be discussing this, but multiple different pathways have been identified some work from our own group looking at resected specimens of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma has identified that the most common genetic mutations were in IDH as well as in KRAS and BRAF. And if you look at the genetic classification of tumors relative to whether the cholangiocarcinoma is perihilar, intrahepatic, or whether it's a gallbladder cancer, you can see that there are different proportions of, um, of the disease that have mutations e EDH1 or 2 gene relative to um, 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 P53 or the KRAS gene. And these mutatic, mu genetic mutations can be uh, prognostic. Um, um, and you can see here that in patients who had a KRAS mutation, that their survival was significantly worse with the median survival of only about one year. Similarly, the IDH uh, mutation has become increasingly important to substratify uh, patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And this is another paper that we published while I was at Hopkins in Nature Genetics that showed the prognostic importance of IDH mutation, which we now know can also be targeted for therapeutic purposes. Similarly, our work has done some, uh, our group has done some work looking at a PD-1 checkpoint 
And we also know that um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, immunotherapy may be applicable to a subset of patients with uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Well, what about the clinical diet of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma? So unlike patients who uh, present with perihilar or distal disease who frequently have jaundice, patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma frequently present with an asymptomatic mass in the liver that is then biopsied. There are no reliable markers to differentiate intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma from metastasis, and most commonly a pathologist looks for biliary dysplasia and performs immunohistochemical staining, looking for a positive staining for AE1, AE3, and CK7 to suggest biliary epithelium. We also routinely preoperatively check tumor markers, but it's important to note that tumor markers tend to be very specific, but not very sensitive, as up to three quarters of patients will have a normal CEA, and even more than half of patients can have a normal CA19-9, even in the setting of having a cholangiocarcinoma. It is important to rule out other primary tumors, and therefore practice, I typically will make sure if the patient is a woman that she has an up-to-date exams and a gynecologic exam, and for all patients, they've had a recent uh, lower endoscopy, but really the workhorse for the preoperative diagnosis of patients with cholangiocarcinoma is a cross-sectional imaging, either CT or MRI. It's important, therefore, to know that there are different morphologic radiographic findings related to intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. There's a so-called mass-forming lesion, which tends to be uh, homogeneous and low attenuating, capsular retraction. And then there's also the periductal infiltrating that can be seen here with periductal thickening, as well as an introductal growth pattern in which you see ductal asia and sometimes an interductal papillary mass. But most frequently, patients will present with a mass-forming lesion, and these are data from the Liver Cancer Study Group of Japan showing that more than 80% of patients will have a mass-forming lesion. On CT, typically these lesions will appear to be um, homogenous, and they will be hypodense, um, on early phases and only later um, on later phases hyper enhance. You will also look for um, peritumoral ductal dilatation. At our center, we tend to uh, favor the use of MRI. And here you can see um, typical features of an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma with panel A showing capsular retraction and a hypodense lesion, panel B showing a necrotic tumor with hyper enhancement on later phases of the MRI, and then panel C showing peritumoral ductal dilatation. I frequently tend to use PET in these patients as these lesions are very PET G avid. And in 20 to 30% of patients, the use of PET will identify occult metastatic disease. And, and sometimes it will identify a positive nodal disease which may change my um, therapeutic approach to favor more of a preoperative chemotherapy approach rather than proceeding directly to surgery. Surgical resection for these patients can frequently be very challenging. Here is a patient of mine who has a very large mass located in the central aspect of their liver with complete occlusion of the right anterior sectoral branch and abutment to the right posterior sectoral branch. These patients frequently require extended hepatic lens, as you can see here. This is a picture after the right a liver as well as segment four has been removed. You can see the main and left portal vein, and then the box to segments two and three of the liver at the base of the umbilical fissure. Here is the um, explant of the uh, tumor. When it comes to surgical resection, obtaining a negative margin is key. Data from our group has shown, however, that whether you perform an anatomic versus a non-anatomic resection does not have a prognostic impact long-term. However, one should achieve a one centimeter margin, as data from our group has shown an incremental worsening of recurrence-free and overall survival as the margin with cases. Sometimes it is necessary to perform a vascular resection at the time of surgery 
in order to obtain a negative surgical margin, and one should do that if necessary. While the perioperative morbidity and mortality may be somewhat increased, especially at centers who do frequently do not perform vascular resections, if one can do this safely, you can see here that the long-term outcomes of patients are comparable if one needs to do a vascular resection to get a negative margin. One area of interest of my last decade has been the staging of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And for the first six editions of the aging manual, there was no for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. It was staged the same as HCC with a single staging system, which empirically does not make sense as these are two very different diseases. Roughly 10 years ago now, we um, attempted to validate aging system um, that was being proposed both in Japan and um, the one being proposed in the AJCC 6th edition and showed that these were very poor at prognosticating patients. And therefore, at that time, we proposed a new side novel unique staging system for patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And this was actually adopted by the CC and incorporated into the seventh edition staging manual. Since that time, our proposed staging system has been validated both in the United States and internationally. And most recently, it has undergo or undergone a revision in the eighth edition, which patients with T1 disease are stratified as T1A for those patients who have a lesion years T1B for those patients with a tumor greater than five centimeters. T2 patients are those individuals with vascular invasion or multifocal disease. And you can see here that this staging system appropriately strategies patients with regards to long-term prognosis. More recently, our group has been interested in looking at tumor birth, which is another way in which patients can be accurately stratified with regards to overall survival and disease-free survival and incorporates both the size and the number of tumors into a simple unified total burden score. We have also proposed novel classification of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma using machine learning. And as you can see here, we have been able to buy three different clusters of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, a common cluster, a proliferative natured tumor, and an inferred tumor, and have demonstrated different long-term prognoses relative to these different clusters. We have also had a long-term interest in how to assess the nodal basin for patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Inter the lymphadenectomy has frequently not been performed for these patients. And as you can see here, even at major centers has only been performed about half of the time. However, when lymphadenectomy is performed, the overall incidence of N1 disease can be as high as 30%. And even if you consider patients who have NX disease to have N0 disease, the incidence would still be around 20%. Our group has tried to identify different models to preoperatively patients will have lymph node metastases and have published online calculators to predict the incidence of nodal metastases using preoperative information. It's important to note that staging of the lymph node is very critical to stratifying patients with regards to long-term prognosis. And in fact, if you do not obtain nodal information, it is probably not worthwhile to patients at all because the factors involved in the T categories, including vascular invasion, as well as single versus multifocal disease, are only relevant in stratifying patients who have N0 disease. Those patients with N1 disease have their prognosis largely driven by the fact of metastatic disease in the nodal basin. Therefore, it is critical to perform a lymphatic time of surgery and the nodal basins that one chooses should be somewhat dictated by the location of the tumor in the lymph. One should also try to achieve at least six lymph nodes in order to accurately stage patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. 
Unfortunately, these data published from our group show that most patients who undergo lymph me will not achieve the requisite since six lymph nodes on pathologic examination. Finally, talking about surgical therapy is important. And I know others will be talking on the, uh, touching on this during their talks, but I do conclude um, uh, discussing this uh, as it relates to surgery, because our group and others have shown that even when we cure when we are patients with curative intent, the overall probability probability of cure is still extremely low at only ten percent, and the reason for this is that most patients will recur. And recurrence is ubiquitous and it is largely systemic in nature. And these data demonstrate that as early as with the following resection, over half of patients will develop a recurrence and roughly half of patients will develop an extra hepatic site of recurrence. And therefore, better systemic therapy is needed. In addition, we have demonstrated that almost one in five patients will develop a very early recurrence less than six months after surgical resection. And using online calculators and other to better identify which patients are at the highest risk for very early recurrence may help inform us which patients may benefit from being treated from neoadjuvant therapy because we know patients who have multiple lesions and or lymph node metastases demonstrated preoperatively will have extremely high rates of recurrence postoperatively. And these patients should likely be treated with preoperative chemotherapy prior to being taken to the operating room for surgical consideration. And that's why adjuvant therapy in these trials are so important to inform us what systemic therapy we should be using in patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So in conclusion, um, hopefully what I've uh, demonstrated uh, today is that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is increasing in incidence. Um, it is a disease that is similar to pancreatic adenocarcinoma in that it is systemic in nature on presentation. Even with curative intent resection, the incidence of recurrence is high and there is a high case mortality associated with this disease. Further studies are needed in order to better identify which patients would benefit the most from preoperative neoadjuvant chemotherapy and also identify which patients would benefit from adjuvant therapy post resection. The best chance at surgical at cure, however, does remain the incorporation of surgery in the therapy of these patients. Surgical resection should involve margin negative resection with a centimeter of margin if possible, and also the routine performance of lymphadenectomy to clear the nodal basin, both for prognostic purposes and also to ensure good local control of um, the perihilar um, and hepatoduodenal ligament uh, area. In the future, similar to uh, colorectal cancer in the management of stage four disease there, the most advances that need to be made are with our colleagues in medical oncology. And as systemic therapy improves for this disease, I anticipate that surgical indications for intra intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma would similarly expand. Again, I would like to thank the Colangio Carcinoma Foundation for the opportunity to present today, and I look forward to the discussion ahead. Thank you.